All right, so uh, welcome everyone to today's webinar, How California's New Anti-Indemnity Law Will Protect Subcontractors. Uh, this is a part of the New Laws Affecting Subcontractors in California uh, series of webinars sponsored by the Area Chapter ASA, ASA LA Orange County Inland Empire, ASA Capital City, ASA California, ASA San Diego County Chapter, and Redwood Empire Chapter of ASA. Uh, please note that uh, today's webinar is being recorded. During the webinar today, if you have any questions, please use the chat function to submit your question, and the presenter will answer your question in chat. Uh, today's presenter is uh, Dan McLennan of McLennan Law Corporation in San Francisco. Uh, Mr. McLennan is uh, ASA of California Government Relations Chair. He has more than 25 years of experience representing subcontractors, suppliers, and other firms in cases involving indemnity, insurance, mechanics liens, um, and other matters resulting in the res resolution of hundreds of cases through mediation, arbitration, and trial. Uh, he has been awarded Martindale Hubble's AV rating, the highest rating in legal ability and ethics, and is a frequent author and speaker for ASA and other construction industry trade associations. We're, uh, we're really pleased to have him uh, presenting our webinar today. Thank you, Dan. All right. Thank you, David. I see that there's a number of old friends, uh, longtime friends on our registration list and a number of new friends. Welcome, everybody. Glad to have you here today. And uh, let me just say right off the bat, I've uh, spoken on this uh, AB, excuse me, SB 474 a number of times, and it feels like old hat to me. Probably doesn't feel like old hat to you, and that's why you're here. So if I start talking uh, using internal lingo and, and uh, concepts that you don't uh, readily grab, let me know. Uh, do a chat uh, to me, and we'll bring it up. Uh, there, let me offer this also, that um, sometimes the uh, chat function isn't really the best way to air out a question, and maybe you want some more detail than we can cover in the uh, conference here today. So let me just give you my email address. It's on the front of the slides here, dmclennan at mclennanlaw.com. I uh, use the mnemonic. It's like John Lennon with an MC in front uh, for Dan McLennan, dmclennan at mclennanlaw.com. Feel free to uh, flash me off an email, and we can start an offline conversation on on any of the questions that may come up, and I'm sure there will, because there's a huge amount of information to this bill, and we're going to try to uh, cover the concepts and actually have a hypothetical in here and, and see if we can put it into practice how it's going to work uh, in real life after uh, January 1, 2013. This is... Uh, a bit of an awkward situation. I wish I could talk to you. I wish we could uh, have eye-to-eye uh, -eye contact and get your questions up front. So uh, sorry for the impersonal nature of the conversation that we're going to have here. All right, let's go into the slides. Uh, first, you have about me, which David already gave you. I'm kind of tickled to uh, have this AVO rating, you know, 9.8 out of 10 points. Uh, this is a pretty recent thing for lawyers to be rated, and so uh, I'm glad that uh, I've, I've got some recognition. Thanks for allowing me a little bit of uh, uh, self-promotion and boasting on that. Oh, by the way, uh, when we're done, if you want a copy of the slide deck, that's fine. Just give me an email, and I'll be glad to shoot it off to you. And so there's a bunch of information in the slides themselves, raising issues and giving some explanation, but also on my website. This is the MLC Web uh, Law Notes blog, and if you go on to the construction section, uh, there's a, an executive summary of SB 474. It goes through all the new sections and all the new changes and gives explanation as to how I think the uh, courts are going to interpret it, although that's... Um, at this point, anybody's guess. I think we have educated guesses, but nobody can tell you with a straight face that they know what the courts are going to do with some of these issues that we're going to be talking about. 
I'm going to try to keep my voice going quickly so that we can get through this. We could go three hours on this stuff, and I have, but I want to keep your attention. Don't want to bore you and uh, give you your uh, Thanksgiving Day nap before Thanksgiving. So I will try to keep it going quickly. And uh, if, if we don't cover everything, that's fine. We can talk offline. My goal is to get you out of here in an hour. Uh, we do have time reserved for questions at the end. If we have to go to an hour and a half, I think that's uh, probably a mistake on my part. My part. So we'll try to get you out of here by 1 o'clock so you can start your Thanksgiving uh, holiday already. OK, SB 474, the purpose. It's stated in the code section itself that it's in the best interest of the state and its citizens to ensure that every construction business in the state is responsible for losses that it, as a business, may cause. So how does the state make construction businesses in the state responsible for losses that it causes? The underlying concept behind 474 is that the courts will no longer allow contractors to shift to subcontractors and others responsibility for the active negligence of the general contractor. And this applies as between subcontractors and lower tier subcontractors as well. So the overview is the new general rule. Type 1 indemnity clauses are no longer allowed in any construction project in California. This means public works and private works and residential. However, there are some exceptions that we'll talk about along the way. Now, what is type 1 indemnity? Most of you folks know what type 1 indemnity is, but for those of you that don't, a little quiz. What is a type 1 indemnity? Is this when subcontractors stand in the shoes of general contractors? Is it oops, when a subcontractor pays for liability of a general contractor? Or C, when a subcontractor buys a general contractor's lunch? Well, obviously, we don't know. <laughs> it's not going to be C. I've, most of you will recognize that A, when a subcontractor stands in the shoes of a general contractor, is a subrogation concept. And so a type 1 indemnity is when a subcontractor pays for the liability of a general contractor. More generally, Indemnity is when one party is called to answer for the liability of another. And it's typically contractual. There are statutory indemnity provisions and equitable indemnity provisions. The type 1 indemnity that we're talking about is express indemnity as written in contracts. And what the legislature has done is prohibited contracting parties from in writing, shifting liability to others downstream. Now this is sample type 1 language. Now there are three different types of indemnities, type 1, type 2, type 3. And actually what the statute is doing is uh, causing indemnity clauses in California construction contracts to uh, become a type 3 clause instead of a type 1. Now type 1 means this is the broadest type of indemnity, the most strong protection for a general contractor or owner or upper tier subcontractor previously allowed by law. And basically it makes a subcontractor responsible for anything that a general contractor does, even if the general contractor is at fault in causing the problem, subcontractor has to pay for it and defend the general contractor or owner uh, from that exposure. 
if it had anything to do at all with the subcontractor's work, whether or not the subcontractor did anything wrong. I mean, this is a huge protection for general contractors and owners. And so the sample language, uh, we focus on express agreement to indemnify and defend the owner and the general contractor from all liability claims, losses, damages, et cetera, et cetera, arising, key language, from the work performed and materials supplied by the subcontractor. Notice, it doesn't say anything about the negligence or fault of the subcontractor. If it just arises out of, and you see other language like related to the subcontractor's work. This is all very broad and means basically if the subcontractor was there, he's on the hook for indemnity. This includes any claim or liability arising from any act, error, or omission, negligence of the indemnity. The indemnity being the person that gets the indemnity from the indemnitor, who is the person that gives the indemnity. So even if the, the owner or the general contractor is negligent, subcontractor is still indemnified. That's the old gold standard language. Now the key that we need to look at for a type 1 indemnity clause is negligence of the indemnity. If a clause does not reference the fault of the indemnities, then it would be a type 2 clause. But since this one has negligence of the indemnities, it's a type 1. But there's even more important language that you need to look for. This is the red flag. If you see this language, this is the telltale sign of a type 1 except for the sole negligence or willful misconduct of the indemnity. Under California law, heretofore, a general contractor could not be indemnified for his sole negligence or willful misconduct. But everything up to that, including negligence or gross negligence, would be something that a subcontractor could indemnify the general contractor for. So two things, look for reference to the fault of the indemnity, which this language underlined here is reference to the fault of the indemnity. And if you see sole negligence or willful misconduct, you've got yourself a type one indemnity clause. Okay, still in the overview, now we're talking about the impact of the new rural owners, with the exception of homeowners and self-performing general contractors or construction managers. Owners and subs may not obtain indemnity for their own act of negligence. So it's all the way down the line. Owners, generals, construction managers, and subs may not obtain indemnity. Now, construction managers uh, previously haven't been referenced in the statutes, and now uh, SB 474 does include them. And we'll talk about these exceptions later because they are pretty uh, potentially big loopholes for general contractors to use. Okay, owners can, but general contractors, construction managers, and subs may not obtain defense against allegations of their act of fault. Okay, so there's two parts when we're looking at exposures for liability on construction projects. Generally, your costs are going to be the cost to defend an action and the cost to pay the person that's been injured. And so the statute, 474, deals with both parts, may not inde obtain indemnity and may not obtain defense. There's an exception. Owners can be de defended for allegations of their own act of fault, but GCs, CMs, and subs may not. Okay, these are, and you're going to find these exceptions and inclusions are just kind of mind-boggling. And I've memorized them now because I've been through it so many several times. I wouldn't expect somebody going through and hearing 
this conversation today to pick up when it applies and when it doesn't. That's why it's handy to have that cheat sheet from my law notes, the executive summary. It's got it broken all down nicely in a couple of pages. Okay, owners, GCs, construction managers, subs, may require others to name them as additional insurers on their insurance policy. Okay, so this is this is a separate stream of protection for a general contractor. First, they can reach into the pocketbook of the subcontractor itself if there's an indemnity clause. And then secondly, the, the owners and GCs can cause subcontractors to provide protection to them, being the general contractors, under the subcontractor's own insurance policy. Basically, it's saying to the general contractor, the owner, you have your own insurance policy, but you now have my insurance policy as an additional policy uh, to your own. So you are now named as an additional insured on my insurance policy. But now this is going to be hotly contested over the years as the courts try to figure out and the parties try to figure out the meaning of SB 474. The statute says that a general contractor or owner can obtain coverage only obtain coverage on the additional insured policy for only the acts or omissions of the promisor. I say, what does this mean? Well, you've got the promisor, who is the subcontractor in this case. So the general or the owner can get additional insured coverage for the acts or omissions of the promisor. Well, previously, additional insured coverage could be for the acts or omissions of the promisee, the general contractor or the owner. So to me, this language by the legislature intends to have something less than what was promised or uh, could be required under prior law. Now, I spoke with Senator Evans's aide who was, is shepherding or was shepherding 474, Evans being the author of the bill, and I asked her, what does this mean? It could be read a couple of different ways. Is it leaving intact the old additional insured provisions, like the gold standard additional insured endorsement, the CG 2010-1185? Or is it saying that there should be a new limited type of endorsement? And her response was, oh, yes, we intended to be able to get rid of the insurance uh, avenue of recovery for general contractors as well. Remember, the overview is no more shifting of responsibility by a party to others. So they can't do it by the indemnity clause, and they can't do it by the insurance provisions either. So that was her position. I don't know that the courts are going to see it so clearly. Now, the effective date of SB 474 applies to contracts and amendments entered on and after January 1, 2013. So if you're a general contractor and you've got some outstanding contracts to sub, make sure you get their signature on it before 1 1 uh, January uh, 13, <laughs> before 1 1 13, and you can still have your indemnity clause. Now, this is curious, your type 1 indemnity clause. The curiosity is about amendments. So we know that some contracts are in, a, in effect already before January 1, 2013. So what happens to them? Well, we know that change orders technically are amendments to contracts. They change the contract price. They sometimes uh, change the contract duration. So they are amendments to the contract. So SB 474. Four applies to change orders signed after 1113. So 
Does a change order after January 1, 2013 make 474 apply to the whole contract that was entered before January 1, 13? After all, the change order affects the whole contract. Or does it just affect the change order work? The statute itself is not clear on that. You're going to probably see lawyers arguing both ways on it. To me, it makes sense just to affect the work that's covered under the change order, which means that if you had a type 1 indemnity clause in effect before 1-1-13 and you have a change order, your old indemnity clause may not apply to the new work, and so you should consider having a separate indemnity clause on your change order form for pre-existing contracts where the change is after 1-1-13. And toward the end of the uh, slide presentation, we have some sample language which you could potentially include in your change order form. All right, what projects are included under 474? Which projects are now affected by the limitation and in indemnity clause types that you can have? Well, the law itself provides that it includes any construction contract. And it defines construction contracts. And it's got a huge one paragraph definition with probably 200 words in it. and Bottom line, it includes any structure, including improvements to real or personal property. All right, well, we get structures on real property, but structures on personal property? I'm scratching my head. <laughs> so basically, SB 474 would apply to a structure built on a trailer bed, perhaps. I'm thinking in terms of the Tournament of Roses Parade. Uh, the floats built on mobile platforms would be personal property, but their structure, so the, the owners of the uh, parade trailers could not get a type 1 indemnity from the guys that put together the frames on which the floats are built. I mean, it's that broad of a definition. So anytime you see any kind of construction, it's probably going to be covered by this prohibition. All right, exceptions. Of course, every rule has to have an exception, and there are 13 enumerated ones. We're not going to go through every one of them in detail, but the main ones that we are going to be concerned about is where there's a contract in private construction where the owner is a general contractor, subcontractor, or supplier, or on his or her own project. So I envision that creative owners and general contractors will, for purposes of getting the additional insured endorsements and the uh, full indemnity from subcontractors and lower tier parties, could give a general contractor a 1% ownership in a project. And therefore, SB 474 would not apply, and the old rules and old contract forms could be used. And then, interestingly, if the general contractor did not make certain milestones or uh, achieve a certain uh, goals of the construction, then Perhaps there could be a clause in their contract that says the 1% ownership interest reverts to the major owner. So it could be a clever loophole for generals working with their owners to avoid the impact of 474. And similarly, when a homeowner is contracting for work on his, his or her own residence, SB 474 doesn't apply, and the sophisticated homeowner can have a type 1 indemnity clause. This probably isn't going to make much difference in the big scheme of things in California. 
another big exception is for wrap-up insurance policies and program contracts. So whereas the subcontract form could not have a type 1 indemnity clause if the project has a wrap-up insurance policy. And by the way, as we go on, um, I'm, I am looking at the uh, chat and question box, so if there are any questions, go ahead and pop them up. I haven't seen any yet. Uh, a wrap insurance program document itself could have a type 1 indemnity clause in it, and it would not run afoul of SB 474. Now, this is interesting because most RAP programs we see uh, do not allow lawsuits between parties that are insured under the program. So why would this make a difference? They have an indemnity where the parties can't sue each other to use the indemnity. My my vision on this is that it could allow shifting of responsibility for large deductibles in the OSIP project or self-insured retentions if there were in the project. But probably more importantly is losses not covered by the RAP insurance. Well, what kind of losses do we have where the RAP doesn't apply? I know that there are many of you on this call that know this better than me, but uh, for example, we see a number of scary programs out there, say $25,000, to excuse me, $25 million total limits on a project that costs $250 million. Well, it doesn't take much of a claim to wipe out those limits early on, and then what happens to later claims? Inadequate limits. So whose insurance would then apply? the subcontractors who's, uh, who's forced to suffer a type 1 indemnity clause as part of the program contract. So inadequate limits happen. We know about that. And also, it's not unheard of where insurers go out of business and leave everybody uncovered. Again, type 1 indemnity supply, which leaves, this is a big uh, gaping hole for subcontractors. So if you've been asleep to this point, wake up here because uh, subcontractors, you've got to make sure that your insurance program outside of a wrap will pick up your indemnity obligations in the event that the wrap program fails or for otherwise reasons does not cover the law. Now, this is a problem for most subcontractors because the wrap-up insurance policies typically are used on residential projects where subcontractors have big, bold exclusions in their policies. And so this is a red flag for any sub entering a wrap program to make sure that they have DIC coverage, which is differences in conditions coverage, which would pick up gaps in the wrap. This is an issue. Uh, take this slide to your uh, your insurance broker and say, are we covered if we get into a RAP program for a type 1 indemnity? Other exceptions, uh, residential for sale units, there's a whole separate section in the law that's not touched by 474, uh, which had limitations on indemnity plus the Right to Repair Act, et cetera for construction defect cases, CD cases, but not BI, bodily injury cases. Uh, design professionals don't apply. You could get a type 1 indemnity there, although design professionals don't generally have deep pockets. Uh, loan and financing documents, your bank certainly is going to be able to get a type 1 indemnity. And then your surety. Uh, who provides your bonds is going to get a type 1 indemnity from the principal. OK, hypothetical for Jimmy. Sorry, Jimmy. Not a happy Thanksgiving for you. Jimmy is a subcontractor employee. He's injured on a shopping mall project. He sues the general contractor. 
we go through trial and the jury finds active negligence by the general contractor 50%, the sub, who's the employer, 25%, and Jimmy himself 25%. Okay, keep this in mind. We're going to keep these numbers are going to be in play as we talk about the uh, impact of 474 and how these indemnities actually play out. Now, upon the receipt of the suit papers, the general contractor tenders to the subcontractor's carrier as an additional insurance. First thing, actually the first thing that they'll do is uh, tender to their own general contractor, uh, general contractor insurance policy, and that carrier will probably then tender to the subcontractors and their carriers, but uh, the general will tender to the subcontractor's carrier as the additional insured uh, person. Now, one trick that my office does quite often when we represent general contractors is we will not tender to our own carrier because under the old rule where we had a 2010-1185, and we'll get into that, uh, the gold standard additional insured endorsement, that policy is supposed to be the primary policy with our policy, the general's policy, not contributing. So we would say to the subs carrier, take it, defend us, call us when the suit is over, and then that subs carrier will then tender to other, other carriers, etc. cetera. But uh, this way, we have in the past been able to protect the general contractor's own insurance program from being involved in some of these claims. The GC will also tender to the sub itself under the indemnity clause, whatever clause may exist at the time. Now, we have four areas of exposure to, to the subcontractor, their exposure to the general, their, their areas of protection. And so there's these threads where this, the general goes for defense by the carrier, defense of the lawsuit, got to have those attorneys, defense by the subcontractor itself. Now hopefully the subcontractor has insurance and its carrier is going to take care of this part. Also, the general is going to go after indemnity from the subcontractor's carrier and indemnity from the sub. Now, if the sub's carrier takes care of the defense and the indemnity, then the sub's free and clear. There's problems if the carrier, for some reason, doesn't take care of all the exposure that might be covered by the indemnity clause that the subcontractor gave contractually to the general. So we're going to pick apart these exposures and see how this plays out under our scenario. Okay, defense. What AI defense, additional insured defense, can the general contractor get, excuse me, require from the subcontractor's carrier? Now we're at the drafting stage in the contract after 474 has been enacted. So we're looking ahead to this lawsuit and what can we put what can a general contractor put into his contract to get insurance coverage from the sub? Can the general contractor require the additional insured defense and indemnity from the sub's carrier for the general contractor's own active negligence? What do you think? Yes or no? What we've been through on 474 already suggests, no, the purpose is to avoid own active negligence. The bill allows the general contractor to require additional insured status for ongoing operations as well as completed ops, covering the acts or emissions of the promisor, which we talked about earlier. Okay, so its own active negligence? No, just the acts or emissions of the promisor. If it's not active negligence by the general contractor, what fault by the general contractor could be covered? I think it leaves an opening for a passive fault of the general, failing to pick up on the idea that, um, uh, for example, uh, general contractor's uh, supervisor is walking on a plank. 
and he sees the hammer sitting on the scaffolding plank, and there's workers down below. He doesn't say anything. Somebody jars the scaffold, the hammer falls, and hits somebody on the head down below. Is that active negligence by the general contractor? Probably not. It's passive negligence for failing to tell somebody to take care of that hammer. So I think that this covers an act or omission of the sub because the sub left the hammer there. Also, the vicarious liability of the general for the acts or omissions of the sub probably are uh, something you can get additional insured status for. But not your own act of negligence. Now, there's language in the bill that this is going to be part of the problem, and I know that some of you folks out there are intimately aware of Presley Homes. This reference in the bill to Presley Homes is going to create a problem because people take Presley Homes to mean that where an insurer has a duty to defend, it means you, it applies to the whole action. That defense covers the entire action, even if the suit has covered and uncovered claims. Or it's got a single claim that's only partially covered by the policy. It's like in for a penny, in for a pound. That, that insurer has to defend everything. This is the Presley holding. Well, 474 references Presley. Presley says, in for a penny, in for a pound. Does that mean that after 474, your additional insured endorsement can require a defense of the entire action, even for the active fault of the indemnity, the general contractor? I think that reading of Presley goes too far because we have to look into Presley itself. And in that case, the indemnity agreement, in the endorsement on the insurance policy provided by the subcontractor limited indemnity to the vicarious liability for the acts of the subcontractor. But it did not limit the defense obligation. So what Presley stands for is when the endorsement on the defense obligation is not limited, then the defense has to include the entire action. But how does Presley apply if the endorsement's limited to cover the acts or omissions of the promisor? I think that Presley is going to say that a limited endorsement limits the amount of coverage. So I don't think Presley stands for the proposition that you can get additional insured endorsement that covers the general contractor's own fault. It would have to be the vicarious or passive fault of the general contractor to be covered under the subcontractor's insurance policy. Now this is the CG 2010-1185 language I talked to you about before. Uh, is this language going to be allowed any more after 474? We don't think so. This is the gold standard. It's very broad and basically says the insurance as afforded by this policy for the additional insured, which the general is forcing themselves to be, shall be primary insurance. That means that this policy answers first before the general contractor's own policy as respects any claim, loss, or liability out of the named insured's operations. That's the arising out of or related to type of language. It says basically if the subcontractor was there, he's the named insured, then the loss, claim, or liability arises out of it. And the, the courts have held this is a very loose standard. Then any other insurance maintained by the additional insured, the general contractor, his other insurance shall be excess and non-contributory with the insurance provided here under. This is the language that we've used before to protect the general contractor's own insurance program and make it excess or excess, non-contributing with the insurance provided by 
the subcontractor, the named insurer. Is this language going to be allowed anymore? I don't think so. Now, it gets a little trickier because what if the subcontract form from the general contractor requires the CG 2010-1185, that very broad endorsement? Which I, you know, every general contract form that I write has that in it. Now, but suppose the sub provides an endorsement that limits the defense and indemnity to claims covered by the sub's policy for the sub's own acts or omissions. Say that that and the endorsement says this insurance will apply only to claims caused by or arising out of the sub's own acts or omissions. Then the general contractor gets a claim, tenders the sub, finds out that the sub's policy provides only for passive or vicarious liability by the general for the sub's own acts or omissions. General contractor sues the subcontractor for breach of the contract. I called for a 2010-1185. You gave me something less. You breached the contract. You didn't give us the the protection that you were required to under the contract. And so you have to pay, Mr. Subcontractor, for the exposure that we have that otherwise would have been covered if you got us the broader endorsement. Will the court find in favor of the general contractor claiming that the general contractor or the subcontractor breached the insurance provision? Or would the court refuse to enforce the insurance requirements calling for the 2010-1185. My opinion is that the court won't uh, enforce the general contractor's insurance provisions that call for too broad of a protection because of the general uh, grant, uh, the general provision of 474 which says that provisions contained in collateral to or affecting any construction contract that purport to insure, including the defense of the general against liability, are void and unenforceable to the extent of the act of negligence or willful misconduct of the general contractor. So this section suggests that it uh, prevents insurance for the act of negligence or willful misconduct. Oops. However, now some, some definitely will argue that this clause applies, but I don't think that the insurance policy is collateral to or affecting the construction contract. Remember that an insurance policy exists well before the construction contract ever came along. And nothing in the bill limits the insurance a carrier may provide. Only the right to require the insurance is limited. I know I'm getting into some muddy water here, but bear with me. There are specific code sections in the insurance code that says, for example, that an insurance policy cannot protect somebody in California for their own willful act. You can't do it. There's nothing in this bill that says that the carrier is prevented from giving a 2010-1185 endorsement. Okay? It just says that the provisions in something collateral to or affecting the subcontract that purport to insure, where the sub itself would stand as an insurer, can't do that. But your own insurer is not prevented. Now, think of it more generally. If, if we could no longer get protection for our own act of negligence, then contractors wouldn't buy insurance at all because they buy insurance to protect against their own acts of negligence. So there has to be some lesser intent in this language about the insurance. And so we have this funny business that happens 
that a general may require AI additional insured status for vicarious and, and passive, but not active. This is my opinion. However, a court won't enforce insurance requirements calling for the 2010-1185, but an insured endorsement that provides coverage for vicarious or passive to the general hasn't been written yet. The, the insurance uh, industry hasn't caught up with it yet, and, and they may not. We've, uh, I've had a number of conversations with underwriters and brokers about this, and they tell me that their underwriters aren't even aware of this issue yet. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Now, okay, suppose that uh, 2010-1185 requirements slips by into a subcontract form, and the sub does provide the CG 2010-1185. Then what happens? Can the general contractor cause the sub's carrier to give the full defense and indemnity from the general contractor's active fault? Yes. Not, not if the carrier limited the endorsement as permitted by statute, which we just talked about, then he wouldn't, the subcarrier wouldn't have to pay for the defense or indemnity of the active fault. But if the uh, carrier did provide it, it would give the uh, indemnity, or excuse me, the defense. Okay, now we're talking the second line of exposure to the subs is the additional insured indemnity on the subs carrier policy. Would the subs carrier have to pay the general contractor's 50% share? Remember, we had general contractor 50% at fault, Jimmy's employer 25% at fault, and Jimmy 25% at fault. So would the subs carrier under the additional insured endorsement have to pay the 50% share? Yes, if the sub mistakenly provides the 2010-1185 or overly protective AI endorsement. No, if the subcontractor limits the endorsement per statute. It would not cover the GC for its own active fault. Okay? Would the subs carrier pay for the subcontractor's 25% share? This is kind of a trick question. We know that Jimmy can't sue the sub, his employer, because the sub's immune under workers' comp. So Jimmy can't recover from his employer. Well, what about general contractor's exposure for subs 25% fault? General contractor and sub, in a hypothetical, both cause the injury. So the general contractor has joint and several liability for the employer's 25% share. So in fact, we see general contractor exposed for 75% and not just 25%. Now, this is for injury lawyers and uh, firms that have had uh, injury claims that go to litigation. There's a difference between what's recoverable by the sub or the employee as to economic and non-economic damages. Prop 51 says joint and several liability applies to economic damage, but not economic. So general contractors not liable for sub 25% share of the non-economic damages because that's not joint and several. However, sub 25% share would be covered if sub were liable, that is coverage for the actual emissions of the promisor, then even under 474 limited endorsement, the sub carrier should pay the general contractor's joint and several liability for the 25% economic damages caused by the sub. Whew. Okay, so, so the sub carrier doesn't pay for the 50% caused by GC, but does pay for the 25% caused by subcontractor, even though subcontractor itself is not liable. OK, 
subs carrier could not recover back from the general contractor's carrier if this language primary and non-contributing is in the endorsement. I don't know that that language will survive 474, but I'm sure some carriers will try to keep it in there. All right. Now, what if the sub failed to provide any additional insured coverage at all, or the AI coverage was by a Lincoln insurance company that failed? General contractor goes after the sub itself. The sub feels like he's being held up by the general contractor. This is the third exposure. Okay, what defense can the general contractor require from the sub? Focusing on defense. Now, this really does make a difference under the new law because there are specific requirements that deal with the defense that may be provided. And this is really picky stuff, folks. Just bear with me. I know it's going to take a lot of patience on your part. Okay, so the provisions talk about the cost of defending being specifically void as dealing with the act of negligence or willful misconduct of the general contractor. Okay, we've seen this section 2782.5a a bunch already. They're saying no defense for active negligence can't be required under your provisions in your contract. But contractual provisions, clauses, covenants, agreements not expressly prohibited are reserved. So this is actually going to be an area for a fair amount of creativity by lawyers to say, OK, the law says we can't do this, but it doesn't say we can't do that. And so there's going to be a fair amount of coverage uh, stuff in contract provisions that are outside of the prohibitions here. So this is something that you're going to be needing to look out for. There is wiggle room here, and I'm sure the general contractor's lawyers are going to find it and try to put it uh, to subcontractors. Okay, we know we've seen this already. GCs can require in this subcontractor that the sub indemnify and defend the GC for all but active negligence, willful misconduct, or design defect. This is old law. This is new law. So here's the wiggle room. Anything but active negligence or willful misconduct or design defect. So what's left? Passive negligence by the GC or vicarious liability of the GC for the subcontractor are two examples. Now, here's, this is new. This is part of the new statutory scheme. It's new in this arena. By the way, this is what the uh, authors of the bill did was they cribbed from the construction defect law changes that happened several years ago. And those provided for a complicated system of defense being provided with allocations of shares and payments by the subs to the general contractor's own counsel or the subcontractor having the choice to provide their own counsel. And basically, the uh, drafters of 474 took that uh, defense scheme from the construction defect arena and modified it into more broadly both construction defect, uh, that was residential in the old scheme, and now for all residential and all commercial and public pro projects in California as well. They did tweak it, and there's some interesting tweaks, which we'll see as we go along. So now, to trigger the sub's defense obligation, if claim happens, general contractor must tender in writing, must include the information provided by the claimants or claimants, so whatever the GC gets, he has to give it to the sub. Relating to claims caused by the subcontractor scope of work. So if it has anything to do with the subcontractor scope, the tender has to be made to that particular sub. Which is important because the new law uh, says that a sub doesn't have to defend or indemnify or work outside of their scope. Now here, 
is an important protection for the sub. The sub gets to choose how to provide the defense. Sub has to respond within 30 days and make a choice. May pay a share of the general contractor's own counsel's bill, subject to true up at the end of the case, meaning if the sub feels they paid too big of a share, they get to prove that they paid it, paid too much, and get a rebate. So pay a share or provide separate counsel to defend the general contractor for damage related to the sub's scope of work. Let's pause here for a second. Now, I've seen general contractors counsel draft a clause that says, this choice is made up front in the subcontract form, getting rid of the opportunity to provide counsel for a sub. If, a, if you see that form where the general is trying to make this choice for you before the claim even happens, strike it out because you have greater protection than the law this probably isn't going to be enforceable because the law gives the sub the choice at the time of the claim. Because how do you know which way you want to go until you get the information provided in the tender letter? Okay. And by the way, your insurance carrier is probably going to choose to do this, to provide separate counsel to defend the scope of work of the sub and incidentally the general contractor. So he is, he's going to be defending the sub's own work anyway, so there's no additional cost for that carrier counsel to pick up the general contractor for that scope as well. So if you see, the, if you see a clause that strikes your ability to provide counsel, your insurance carrier may have a problem with you uh, and say, well, you can't limit our right to uh, protect the general contractor using our own counsel. So this is a big deal. When the tender happens, I submit that subs should send it immediately to their insurance carrier, and the carrier gets to make the choice of how this is going to happen. By the way, do you want to pay? This is going to be a sneaky area for general counsel because the general counsels uh, should pass through only the cost related to the sub's own scope. But we know that generals will be defending their own active negligence and trying to pass on to the sub through the general contractor's counsel bills the cost of the general's own active fault. It can be a real mess to try to sort that out. OK, if the sub chooses to pay a share, then the general has to provide a, a statement how the allocation is made. This is new. It must include an allocation to the general and any sub with exposure, whether or not any sub is there. Can't force the sub to share an orphan share. That is, is that if, say, two subcontractors on a project that are involved go out of business, you, the subcontractor, cannot be forced to pay their share. You only pay your share for your scope of work. Then the sub is entitled to a reallocation after settlement of judgment after the actual shares are determined. If the sub chooses to provide counsel, then the sub counsel controls that part of the defense related to their scope of work, including the defendant general's exposure for the sub's scope. Must defend allegations that the sub contributed to cause, does not include the defense of the general scope of work or the general's acts or omissions. So if you're the, the subcontractor's attorney defending the general contractor can tell the general, I'm not going to inquire or deal with anything that you did on this job, whether affirmatively or negatively, that's got to be done by your own counsel. This is exactly why you, the subcontractors and insurance carriers are going to want to provide their own counsel because they can have a tight control over how much of a defense is given. 
Now, this is a, a protection for the general contractor. If the sub says, wait a minute, it's not my fault. I don't have to pay that allocation that you gave to me. The sub has to provide all proof of that allegation to the general contractor informally, just on demand by the general. It's like free discovery. This is not, this is new, it's not in the prior residential section. Then if the sub fails to provide a defense, general can sue and get attorney's fees. General contractor can get attorney's fees for protecting himself, but if the general fails to true up and the sub has to recover, has to sue to get uh, back the overpayment that he made in defending, he gets uh, interest and penalties, but no attorney's fees. Hmm, who stacked the deck on this one, I wonder? Now, in Jimmy's case, the general contractor would get from the sub at the sub's choice either the attorney appointed by sub or payment of part of the attorney's fee. Which choice do you think the sub's carrier would prefer? Let me beat it, <laughs> beat this drum one more time. The sub's carrier is probably going to want to provide defense counsel. All right, last thread of exposure. What indemnity may the general contractor require from the subcontractor? I think you probably already have a good sense of this. And so this is this is straight SB 474 talking. The indemnity clause may make the sub liable for vicarious or passive, that is only active negligence may not be indemnified. And the sub does not indemnify the general contractor for general contractor's 50% fault. That was active negligence by general contractor in causing Jimmy's injury. Since indemnity for the general, liab uh, general contractor's liability, general, so general joint and several liability for 25% caused by sub is not expressly prohibited, the general contractor may require indemnity from sub for this share. That is, joint and several liability, which is a form of vicarious liability, loosely speaking for the lawyers out there, I know that's not technically correct, but conceptually it's like vicarious liability. So the liability clause may cover joint and several liability for the sub's 25% share that he caused. By the way, this is in the defense area. Even if there's no indemnity clause, if a general is hit with vicarious liability for claims caused by the sub who has defended the general, then the vicarious liability of the general is directly enforceable against the sub by the general contractor. So this is, you know, we talked earlier about having statutory indemnity and equitable indemnity and express indemnity. This is a form of statutory indemnity imposed on a subcontractor by a general contractor even if the indemnity clause is not enforceable, to the extent the subcontractor caused the problem. So just to be aware of, now if Jimmy sues owner, and owner self-performed any of the work, then owner could obtain a type one indemnity and defense from the general contractor and others. This is that exception we talked about. Now, the general is going to want to have flow down provisions, which will complicate his insurance or his indemnity clause. So you'll look out for this where, where the uh, subcontract form tells you that owner is owner 
builder or the general has any ownership percentage, then there will be a type one indemnity and the general contractor will uh, impose that on the subcontractor as well. Would the results be different if Jimmy were injured on a school project in public works? Same rules apply to the general contractor. If Jimmy sued the school, then the school could require full defense from the general, full defense, including claims of active negligence by the school. Public entities get more defense than private entities. The school could require indemnity only for the school's vicarious or passive, but not active. Same indemnity rule not allowing even public entities to avoid uh, liability for their own active fault. Would the results be different if Jimmy were injured on a personal residence project? Another exception. Same rules apply downstream from the general, but for the owner, there's an exception. How about construction defects versus bodily injury? Hmm. Not really. Same, same rules apply. Insur indemnity insurance limitations are same as for bodily injury cases. But what you'll see is um, there is this, we talked about this, the residential for sale unit section and the, uh, the old law. Uh, the rules under 474 are the same as for uh, construction defect and bodily injury. But in CD cases, the practicalities are going to be much more complicated because of the number of subcontractors and their unrelated scopes of work. And there's going to be a lot of infighting among the subcontractors about, not my scope, not my scope, you know, my scope was limited, your percentage should be bigger, et cetera, et cetera. Now, how do the subs protect themselves in light of 474? We are getting toward the end, so thank you for your patience and sticking with me. I can see that most of you guys are still here. Uh, how can the subs protect themselves? Now, suppose that you get a type 1 indemnity clause uh, put across the table for you. Do you sign it? Knowing, aha, this is, we're after January of 2013, and 474 says your type 1 indemnity clause is no longer enforceable, so I'm going to leave it. Then when you sue me for indemnity, the judge is going to say, forget it. That's actually a possible uh, scenario. My preference is to take the bull by the horns and uh, negotiate it to the extent allowed by law, to the protections allowed by law. And here's sample language for you. These indemnity and defense obligations shall not apply to the extent the claims were caused by the act of negligence, sole negligence, or willful misconduct of the indemnified parties, et cetera. So just I do a carve out. This is the old type one language. Do a carve out. Shall not apply to the extent caused by the act of negligence of the GC or the owner of the indemnified party. Now, the contract also contains a demand, Mr. Subcontractor, you must provide me a 2010-1185 super broad gold standard protective additional insured endorsement. What do you say, subcontractor? Do you push back and say, no, not going to give it to you? And this is the biggest problem that we've had in conversations with the general contractors and other counsel is, well, I may not be allowed to get it under the law, but I'm going to require it anyway. And if your insurance carrier gives it to me, I'm going to have the protection I want. And I'm sorry, I can't require it, but I'm asking you to give it to me. And by the way, if you don't give me this endorsement, I'm sure I'll find other subcontractors who will. So this is really a tough negotiating point for subcontractors, and I don't have an answer to it. I do have some suggested language that you might try where you scratch out the demand for the 2010-1185 and put in that 
subcontractor shall cause its insurance policy to be endorsed, naming contractor and owner to the extent of coverage for acts or emissions of the subcontractor during, excuse me, looking for a question here. Uh, I thought I saw one come up, but no. Uh, to the extent of coverage for the actual emissions of the subcontractor during ongoing and completed operations. So, Mr. Subcontractor, you could push this back across the table to the general and say, this is the, uh, the endorsement that I'm at law maximum required to give to you. This is what I'm willing to give to you. And then if the, the general should accept it because he should know under 474 he can't require any more than that. On the other hand, watch out for what you ask for because, okay, you just promised to give them some kind of coverage that you send to your insurance broker and say, here's my, my insurance requirements, give me an endorsement that says this, and they'll scratch his head and say, well, we don't have that yet, and so they're going to have to get creative at that point to come up with it. Otherwise, uh, I really don't have much advice on that. It's just a tough negotiating point, and I'm sure you're going to, you subcontractors are going to be faced with generals that say, I don't care what 474 says, I want my 2010, 1185, or equivalent. Well, we've gone just over, let's see, yeah, about an hour and 12 minutes. Sorry for taking so long, but thank you uh, for participating. Hope you have a wonderful holiday. And if there's any uh, last questions here, I'm looking at the chat. I don't see anything. Certainly, if you uh, have any questions, I'm happy to talk. Uh, you've got my phone number is 415-394-6688, or drop me an email. Uh, you've got uh, D. McLennan, MLC would work, D. McLennan at mclennanlaw.com. Uh, drop me an email if you want a copy of the slides, if you want a copy of my law notes. Uh, if you don't want to uh, wait for me to get you the law notes, you can go easily to mclennanlaw.com and pick up the uh, executive summary on 474 on our website. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Dan. And uh, I'll just give folks just an, another moment for uh, if they have any questions that they'd like to submit in chat. Um, in the meantime, I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, um, uh, Dan will be presenting uh, another webinar in our series um, on December 5th at the same same time, 12 o'clock noon. Uh, and this uh, next webinar will be uh, what changes to California's lien law uh, mean for subcontractors. So we, we look forward to that. I didn't. I don't see any additional questions in chat. If you think you may have a question, um, go ahead and, and put it in chat. Otherwise, uh, Dan give you his email. And uh, hope everybody uh, has a, uh, a happy Thanksgiving. Okay. Well, with that, I don't see any new questions. So we'll sign off. Thank you, David. Great. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.